All right, this is the recorded lecture for endocrine system. Here's the objectives. It's a relatively short lecture. Um, endocrine system coordinates our body functions. So it's like our, um, like our nervous system, except since it uses chemical messengers, it's slower because most of the stuff has to go through our blood. Uh, lasts longer and it's electrical versus chemical. Uh, it uses hormones and the hormones can affect just a local area or they can affect a um, uh, wider area, this, the systemic area. Paracrine hormones only affect tissues in, in a very local area and the autocrine only affect the tissues that made the hormone. A couple different types. Um, hormone, you have steroid hormone, mainly based off of cholesterol. Peptide hormones are uh, short chains of amino acids. Remember, amino acids are what make up proteins. Um, and they're produced in smaller places like uh, the pituitary gland uh, in the brain. Uh, protein hormones are longer chain hormones, and uh, amine hormones are based off of the um, amino acid tyrosine. Prostaglandins are lipid-based paracrines, and they only act locally, um, and they're made only when, as they're needed. So when the local tissue needs it, it makes it. Control the endocrine system. The um, in A and P one we talked a lot about homeostasis and what negative feedback was, but a lot of times our endocrine system is controlled through negative feedback, where whatever the desired effect of the hormone is. So let's say it's to decrease blood calcium. When blood calcium falls below a certain level, the hormone um, that was being released to decrease blood calcium will stop being released. The hormones in general have a half-life. Remember, if you uh, a half-life is where if you have 500 milligrams of something after one half-life you'll have 250, and then after another half-life, you'll have 125. So the each hormone has its own half-life, and it depends on uh, what the structure is of the hormone. Is it systemic or is it a local hormone? Um, the nervous system, um, hormones coming out of the nervous system, um, or I should say the nervous system controlling hormones would be like things like epinephrine or norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla. Hypothalamus in the anterior pituitary, so this, this nomenclature with the pit that's pituitary in the subscript and he's anterior because we're also going to have posterior pituitary. Uh, these two are, are the biggest players in the endocrine system. And other, uh, other glands, uh, substrates, or other molecules fall or rise to a certain set point, the glands will release hormones to correct it. Um, for example, when blood glu glucose goes up, the pancreas releases insulin. Mechanisms for the um, peptide hormone actions. Um, the, so the trapezoidal little red thing here is a, um, is a hormone, peptide hormone. And it's going to combine with some receptor on this outside of the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane here. 
and it's going to combine with that receptor. And when it does, it activates something on the inside of the cell membrane called G protein. And G protein activates adenylate cyclase. So, oh, or adenylyl cyclase, adenylate, adenylyl, same thing. Um, and if it's a cyclase, remember anything that ends with A's generally is an enzyme. The adenylate cyclase takes two phosphate groups off of ATP. ATP is that energy molecule. So the adenylate cyclase will make it AMP, um, and then it forms cyclic AMP from that. Okay, the um, adenylate or the cyclic AMP now will activate some some other um, enzyme. Okay, and then that enzyme will phosphorylate a protein, and um, the phosphorylated protein is what causes the cell's response. So, this is a very general thing where. For different hormones and different actions of those hormones, this could have many, many, many steps, or maybe many phosphorylated proteins in there. Um, the other pathway here, the difference is that the IP3 causes calcium to be released. So you still get the G protein. There's no um, adenylate cyclase, though. And um, the calcium binds with... Um, calmodulin for an additional response. Uh, phosphodiesterase inactivates CMP, and I know that's in the reading, so you need this constant stimulation to keep the effect happening because otherwise the cyclic AMP will um, be inactivated. Steroid hormones are a little bit different. Since steroid hormones are made out of the same thing as the um, as the cell membrane, they're both made out of lipids, the steroid hormone can pass directly into or through the cell membrane and into the cell. So it doesn't need a, necessarily need a receptor on the outside. On the inside of the cell, there's a receptor that'll help bring it into the nucleus, and then you can have a direct effect of that um, of that um, whatever steroid hormone, whatever it's trying to do, maybe it's to make a protein or cause the cell to do something. It can directly affect the DNA in there, and that's where we get. Remember transcription, where we're making our mRNA, and translation, where we're making our actual protein. So. These are the, um, this is the second objective where we talk about functions, products, locations, target tissues of the different hormones in the glands. Endocrine glands in general produce and secrete hormones. They secrete it into the blood generally and they respond to negative feedback. So either they respond to an increase in hormone levels or a decrease in the stimulus that caused that hormone to be released. Okay. Endocrine failures can be any of these, and the book has some good reading on that, but you know, in general, the, the, horm the endocrine failure can happen because the hormone is not being secreted, or it's not being made correctly, or being made at all, or it doesn't, the gland's not responding to the stimulation to make it, or there's an issue with transportation either in the blood or into the cells, or the receptors on the cells aren't there. Okay, hypothalamus in the pituitary gland. Hypothalamus is here in green, the pituitary gland is um, here. And then with that cell atursica. Okay. Hypothalamus um, controls the uh, anterior pituitary 
through hormones in the blood. So the hypothalamus will release some hormones into the hypophysial portal vein, and that will go down into the um, anterior pituitary. And then it controls the posterior pituitary through, the, through a nerve function. All right. So for most of these, and we're not going to go through every hormone that's in the book, but we're just going to kind of hit the highlights of them. And you know, as you read it, try to think of what is the tissue that the, that the gland is targeting? What's the hormone that the gland is releasing? And all of these ones right here are all um, hormones coming out of the hypothalamus that are affecting the anterior pituitary. Okay? The, there's a table in your book that you should become very familiar with. And the table, I believe, is on 511. But the table itself, it's not a table, it's a diagram. It's on 511. It is um, 501. 501 in your textbook. The, that diagram shows what the, um, the hormones that are being released from the hypothalamus and what they're, do, what they're causing the anterior pituitary to do. So that is a great diagram to look at and memorize and try to understand. So we'll just go through a few of these. The target tissue for the first one is the posterior pituitary. And the hormone released are the antidiuretic hormone to cause the kidneys to, um, oh, I skipped way ahead, sorry, I, I skipped this part. Um, target tissue, anterior pituitary, and all of these hormones. So um, the um, growth hormone releasing hormone is released by the hypothalamus, and it tells the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone. The hypothalamus also releases somatostatin, which tells the anterior pituitary to stop releasing hormone, which is what this negative feedback is. Prolactin releasing factor, released by the hypothalamus to tell the anterior pituitary to release prolactin. Um, TRH is the uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone. CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, and GNRH is gonadotropin releasing hormone. Okay, and then back to this one. Hypothalamus, the target tissue is the po posterior pituitary, and it causes the posterior pituitary release the antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. Oxytocin is there to cause um, uterine contraction and milk production. Antidiuretic hormone, we'll talk more about this when we get to the urinary system, causes the kidneys to reabsorb some water. <clears throat> so we'll talk about those a little bit more here. Uh, posterior pituitary, the target tissue, the V1 receptors in smooth muscle and V2 receptors in the collecting ducts. The Smooth muscle V1 receptors are found in the blood vessels, and these cause um, the uh, blood vessels to actually close up to help increase your uh, peripheral resistance. The V2 receptors are in the kidney tubules um, in the collecting ducts of the nephrons in your kidneys and it causes you to keep water or reabsorb water from the urine or from where the urine is going to be. So both of these will increase your blood pressure because you'll have more peripheral resistance with the vasoconstriction and more water retention, increasing the volume of the blood. And then uterine and vaginal musculature is a target tissue for oxytocin um, and it helps, um, doesn't cause milk production, it helps to cause the milk to be released.
All right, anterior pituitary. So we're now on to um, all the hormones from the anterior pituitary. The hormone's the growth hormone. It targets bone, connective tissue, and muscle. And it causes those um, tissues to uh, mature and get bigger. Most active during, um, from even before we're born to age 17. And this is variances. I mean, for some people, it's more active until they're 13 or 14, and some all the way until they're 20. Another anterior pituitary is the prolactin. This is one that actually causes the milk production, targets the mammary glands, um, and generally only functions after someone has given birth. So this is why a very long time ago, or even now, though, they have wet nurses who nurse other people's babies, and they're generally women who have already had babies. <coughs> the... Next, um, we just put all these ones together. Anterior pituitary targets the thyroid with the thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, and it stimulates the thyroid to produce thyroxin. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Anterior pituitary also sends adrenocorticotropic hormone to the adrenal cortex, and it causes the adrenal gland to produce and secrete its hormones. And then the anterior pituitary sends out gonadotropic hormone to the gonads and tells that to secrete its own hormones. Okay, thyroid one, you're definitely going to want to read this in the book a few times because this one tends to be a little confusing. Um, but the thyroid hormone, or the thyroid gland, I should say, um, is going to target all cells that use energy and the two hormones are um, triiodothyronine and thyroxine t3 and t4 they increase the metabolism of those cells so to do that they cause um, glucose to be taken in and broken down um, they increase the lipid breakdown and increase protein synthesis the thyroid gland itself is located just in front of your pharynx, or just below your larynx, I should say, and just in front of your trachea. Uh, someone who has hyperthyroidism, they have a higher basal metabolic rate, so they're hyperactive and they lose weight easily. So this is a goiter, and goiters happen when there's not enough iodine in someone's diet. The reason why iodine is important is that iodine is, um, is converted, or I should say iodide, is converted to iodine in the thyroid gland. And the precursor to T3 and T4 is thyroglobulin. When the hypothalamus senses there's not enough T3 or T4, it sends more thyroid releasing hormone or thyrotropin releasing hormone to the anterior pituitary and that will release more anterior pituitary will release more thyroid stimulating hormone when there's not enough T3 and T4 the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary are inhibited the goiters themselves this goiter is just the accumulation of thyroglobulin and the follicular cells of the thyroid gland. The follicular cells are there, um, are the ones who are making the T3 and T4. So if there's not enough iodide in someone's diet, then they can't, and this is when a goiter obviously gets out of control. So I'm going to go back to this picture. So what happens is when the hypothalamus senses there's not enough T3 or T4, go back here. So the hypothalamus senses there's not enough T3 or T4 and it tells the anterior pituitary 
to release its hormone so we can make more T3 and T4. Anterior pituitary, so is the one releasing the thyroid stimulating hormone. The thyroid stimulating hormone, and this is the TRH thyrotropin releasing hormone. The anterior pituitary tells the thyroid, hey, we need more T3 and T4. and T4. And the thyroid says fine, they'll use the follicular cells to make some. Well, if there's not enough iodide, it can't make T3 and T4. So the hypothalamus, not sensing any more T3 and T4, tells the anterior pituitary, hey, you need to release more thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone goes to the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland keeps making these T3 and T4s, um, but without the iodide, or the iodine, iodide to be converted to iodine, then all you have is the thyroglobulin increasing. And anytime our body has a demand for something, it makes cells, so like we work out and need our muscle cells, our body will sense that, hey, you don't have enough muscle cells to do what you need to do and we'll build muscle. Same thing happens here, we're gonna add follicular cells. But it's not gonna work because there's not enough iodide in a person's diet. So that's what those goiters are, they're just that accumulation of those follicular cells in the iodide. Um, it's also the reason why we have iodized salt. Have you ever seen salt in the store and it says iodized? Um, that's been a pretty common practice for us in the United States, at least since you know, the Dust Bowl, but for a long period of time. Um, okay, another hormone from the thyroid gland is uh, calcitonin. Calcitonin targets bones, and it tells the bones to increase calcium uptake in the, into the bones. So... If there's uh, enough, if there's um, excess calcium in the blood, it'll tell the, the thyroid will tell the um, calcitonin to increase, or it'll release calcitonin, and that tells the bones, hey, you need to take in this. The bones are really just a store place for calcium. We don't, our body doesn't necessarily care that our bones have a lot of calcium. It's more just like the bank that we keep it. I, um, so calcitonin specifically though, remember these two cells, the osteoclast, it's gonna inhibit the osteoclast. So it'll keep those cells that break down bone inhibited and it stimulates osteoblasts, the ones that build bone. All right, parathyroid hormone targets blood, kidneys, intestine with a parathyroid hormone, I should say parathyroid um, glands. Uh, and these are glands that are on the outside of the thyroid gland. Um, it causes you to increase your calcium in your blood. So if you have low blood calcium, the parathyroid glands will release parathyroid hormone and um, you will, uh, well, one of the things is you increase your vitamin D synthesis by the kidney, um, increase calcium absorption in the intestine, and you increased your osteoclast activity because you'll break down bone so you can release calcium. We need calcium in our blood to continue to live. Adrenal glands are on top of the kidneys. There's two portions. The adrenal medulla, um, hypothalamus controls that through nerves. And so that's the sympathetic nervous system. And the adrenal cortex, um, which is through the anterior pituitary, 
<clears throat> through the adrenal corticotropic um, hormone. So let's talk about the medulla first. The medulla is um, part of the sympathetic nervous system, or controlled through the sympathetic nervous system. It controls blood vessels, blood glucose, breathing, heart, um, as it uh, will increase all of the, or increase your breathing, increase your heart rate. Epinephrine, that's what adrenaline does, it increases all those. Norepinephrine generally um, decreases those. The, this is your fight or flight system where um, if we have to fight something or run away from it, we're going to want our heart rate to go up or we're going to take in more oxygen. We want our blood vessels and our muscles to open up so we can get more oxygen and glucose there and blood vessels say in our digestive system to shut down because we don't want to be digesting food and wasting that energy digesting while we're trying to run away from a saber-toothed tiger. Okay. Uh, adrenal cortex, target tissues, blood glucose, hormones, cortisol. Um, the hypothalamus releases that corticotropin releasing hormone and sends it to the anterior pituitary, which releases adrenal corticotropic hormone. And the um, adrenal cortex then releases cortisol, which regulates um, our blood glucose. So it'll stimulate our liver um, for that glycogen. Lipid release from adipose tissue also inhibits that protein synthesis. All right, testes, target tissues, everything, but mainly bone, muscle, and brain, hormones, testosterone, and it causes enlargement and maturation of tissues. Ovaries, target tissue is the brain and subcutaneous fat, uh, endometrial, so talking about endometrial lining in the uterus and bone. Hormones are estrogen and progesterone. And same thing as testosterone, tissue maturation and tissue development. Pancreas um, targets a lot of different tissues, but we just put muscles on here. Insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. The glucose is produced um, by the liver lipids into glycogen and fatty acids and then um, allows glucose into the cells and stores lipids and protein synthesis. So especially the insulin one, you know, the, especially if you're going to go to nursing or something like that, you're going to see a lot of, oh, I need to remind you there's a gross picture coming up. Um, and someone who had a uh, who has diabetes and um, had a sore in their foot. So this is a really gross picture, but it helps to show why this is such an important thing when you go to the doctor's office and they have that thing that says, "Oh, do you have diabetes? Well, take your socks off. We want to see your feet. They're not just uh, weirdos." Um, so gross picture coming up. So this is what can happen if one of those sores gets out of control. Okay, and then finally, the other glands, um, other glands secrete melatonin, and, oh, I'm sorry, pineal gland secretes melatonin, so pineal gland functions in our, our circadian rhythm, so our diurnal rhythm, the reproductive cycle. Thymus releases thymosin, and this matures our T lymphocytes, which are part of our... Um, immune system. So that was a pretty quick introduction to all those hormones. Most of it you'll get through the reading, um, but this just gives you an idea of how those are organized. Because if you try to do the reading and just read it for, um, for content, you're going to get really bogged down. So really look for the target tissue, or the hormone, the target tissue, and what it does. And this just gives you a nice little
practice quiz or just a way to review this stuff.